Hi, and uh, welcome to our worship service again. Um, many of you know that I'm Melissa McDade, and I'm the pastor at St. Paul and Norrisville United Methodist Churches, which are both in northern Hartford County, uh, Maryland. And um, this is our second try. Um, last week worked wonderfully. I mean, we had a few little glitches, but nothing major. And, um, and lots of folks got to watch it, and uh, we're tickled to death about that. Um, so today is the, um, the uh, we're going to talk about the fifth Sunday of Lent. Um, next week is Calm and Passion Sunday. So I want you to be thinking about that as we go into the week. And that's the beginning of Holy Week. Um, and we'll be, um, we'll be getting ready for that. Um, one of the things that I've read a lot about and I've been urging folks to do um, because they're stuck at home, the whole family is for the most part, um, is to make a, maybe a worship center um, for times like this when you watch me or you listen to me um, or you read my sermons. Um, um, you might have a cross someplace at home. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could be something that you make. Uh, maybe a candle, um, any kind of candle. Um, this one actually has my daughter's picture um, of her dog in a tutu um, that she made for me for Christmas one year. And um, so I thought I'd put that out um, because that always reminds us of the light of Christ. Um, having a Bible handy um, or laid out just on regular days, not just when you're watching a YouTube but um, throughout the week, um, you might be urged to read a little bit um, or to find out what we're going to be reading for next week or what we've read this week and, and read over those passages again. Um, one of the passages I've recommended to folks is Psalm 46 um, for this time. Um, um, and there are others as well. So keep, keep your Bible out and handy um, so that you are more apt to read it. Um, so I've also uh, mentioned to my, my regular congregation that we're reading um, or we're talking about a passage from John's Gospel today, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 45, which is the story of the raising of Lazarus. So if you haven't read that ahead of time, um, and you might want to get your Bible out now and, um, and kind of lay it open so as I talk about verses, you can look at them, um, or you can read it later too if that's more convenient for you. Um, and there's also lots of songs that go with this, hymns um, and, um, um, and, and things that you could listen to on YouTube um, or you can look up the words to. Um, there's Lord of the Dance and Spirit of the Living God, um, maybe a golden oldie like Just a Closer Walk with Thee, um, Hymn of Promise, um, Holly, Holly, Hallelujah is a good one. And you can get that on YouTube um, in a bunch of different places and you can um, play it for the kids. You can play it as you as you clean the house, and it makes you kind of dance around. It's a peppy one. Um, uh, Patty Loveless has an old song called "Raise Up Lazarus," which tells this story as well. And you can get that on YouTube or or Josh Groban's "You Raise Me Up." Um, that's always a lot of fun to listen to. Um, and um, and you can if you don't want to listen to it from Josh Groban, check out. Um, there's a couple of versions on America's Got Talent. Um, of newbies singing it, um, and it's just beautiful. Um, so, so be thinking about that, because um, music helps us during a time like this as well. So hear these words that call us into worship. It's a verse from um, that John 11 passage where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. My friends, let us pray together. Holy God, in silent sanctuaries, in our homes or offices. Wherever we are in these moments of worship, we know you greet us with joy and wonder. We are always enveloped by your grace. During these days of isolation and worry, in this time of uncertainty and fear, Jesus challenges us to share his love wherever we go. Even in these times of safe distancing, we can offer healing and hope to others through a phone call or an email, maybe a wave to a neighbor or an old fashioned letter. Lord, give us comfort and hope in this time. May your peace envelop us all now and always. Amen. Often at funerals, I say probably the psalm that touches us the most during times of grief and we're going through some grief right now, um, or heartache, um, is the 23rd Psalm. And, um, and maybe that's one that you know by heart. 
and you can say these words with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, fear, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, we know that psalm, many of us know that psalm by heart, and we can say it over and over. And um, in the back of my mind, first of all, that's wonderful to do that. Um, and it's good to have those verses that we can um, remember off the top of our heads. And yet sometimes when we say it over and over again, we don't always think about it. So I'm going to share it again in a different translation that I just heard yesterday, actually from my, my yoga instructor. Um, and I thought these words were beautiful. Uh, it's the 23rd Psalm from the Passion Translation. The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my light, life. He opens me before pathways to God's pleasures and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so I can bring honor to his name. Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me, for you already have. You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way, your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely, for you are near. You become my delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterward, when my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. Powerful words. As we talk about Lazarus today, um, who died and then Jesus brought back to life, um, I thought a good book um, to read to kids, and kids of all ages, um, is one called Water Bugs and Dragonflies. Um, by Doris Stickney. Um, it's a book that I've had for a long time, um, and I know you can read the story online, and you can also find it um, on YouTube um, if you want to read it again. Down below the surface of a quiet pond lived a little colony of water bugs. They were a happy colony living far away from the sun. For many months, they were very busy. Scurrying over the soft mud on the bottom of the pond, they did notice that every once in a while, one of their colonies seemed to lose interest in going about with its friends. Clinging to the stem of a lily pond, it gradually moved out of sight and was seen no more. Look, said one of the water bugs to another, one of our colony is climbing up the lily stalk. Where do you suppose she's going? Up, 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 she went slowly. Even as they watched, the water bug disappeared from sight. Her friend waited and waited, but she didn't return. That's funny, said one water bug to another. Wasn't she happy here? Asked a second water bug. Where do you suppose she went? Wondered a third. No one had an answer. They were greatly puzzled. Finally, one of the water bugs, a leader in the colony, gathered his friends together. I have an idea. The next one of us who climbs up the lily stalk must promise to come back and tell us where he or she went and why. We promise, they all said solemnly. One spring day, not long after that, the very water bug who had suggested the plan found himself 
climbing up the lily stalk. And up, up, up he went. Before he knew what was happening, he had broken through the surface of the water and fallen onto the broad green lily pad above. Weary from his journey, he slept. When he awoke, he looked about with surprise. He couldn't believe what he saw. A startling change had come to his old body. His movement re revealed four silver wings and a long tail. Even as he struggled, he felt an impulse to move his wings. The warmth of the sun soon dried to the moisture from the, um, from the new body. He moved his wings again and suddenly found himself up above the water. He had become a dragonfly. Swooping and dipping in great curves, he flew through the air. He felt exhilarated in the new atmosphere. By and by, the new dragonfly lighted happily on a lily pad to rest. And then it was that he chanced to look below to the bottom of the pond. Why, he was right above his old friends, the water bugs. There they were scurrying about, just as he had been doing some time before. Then the dragonfly remembered the promise. The next one of us who climbs up the lily stalk will come back and tell where she, he or she went and why. Without thinking, the dragonfly darted down. Suddenly he hit the surface of the water and bounced away. Now that he was a dragonfly, he could no longer go into the water. I can't return, he said in dismay. I tried, but I can't keep my promise. Even if I go back, not one of the water bugs would know me in my new body. I guess I'll just have to wait until they become dragonflies too. Then they'll understand what happened to me and where I went. The dragonfly winged off happily into its wonderful new world of sun and air. The end. I hope you like that. Um, it kind of reminded me of Lazarus. Um, Lazarus died. Um, he went into the tomb, um, and um, and he came out. He looked the same, um, but something had changed in him. If you haven't um, read this passage yet from your Bible, um, you might want to grab it and, and follow along as I talk about it. There's an old story about a man who died in a town long, long ago. And they had a funeral at home, as was the custom of the day, um, with the preacher and the immediate family on the front porch and all the mourners scattered out throughout the yard and an open casket in the back of a mule-drawn wagon. After several sermons and eulogies and much weeping and gnashing of teeth, the widow climbed into the wagon seat next to the undertaker who drove the wagon up on the hill to the family cemetery. The road went underneath the limbs of this large, sprawling oak tree, and the wagon bumped heavily on an, on an exposed root. And at that moment, the deceased snorted and coughed and sat up in the casket, not dead but alive, having been in a deep coma, apparently. Well, some years later, the man died again. And his funeral was pretty much the same as the first one. As the wagon neared the old oak tree, the widow leaned over and whispered to the driver, why don't you go wide around this tree? It's kind of like our story this morning about Lazarus in two ways. One, there were some who would have preferred the corpse to stay dead. And two, you have to wonder what it felt like to come back to life. Maybe you've heard the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus before. They were Jesus's closest friends. Jesus stayed at their home often and ate meals with them. So when it was obvious that Lazarus was seriously ill and showed no signs of getting better, the sisters sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. And Jesus' response was, Pretty simple and nonchalant. A sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. 
Jesus loved his friends. There was no doubt about it. Yet it's important for us to notice this. When Jesus heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. That one, one sentence would make a good sermon topic itself. God's timetable is not our timetable, is it? What was Jesus doing during those 48 hours? We don't know. Except that we've been in the same situation and are in that situation right now. Why do we have to wait for God to act? How many times have you prayed that Jesus would come and heal a loved one and, and Jesus lingered someplace far off and you were left? alone in silence. That's what faith is all about, my friends. It's about believing in God and God's care, even during those times when God seems absent. If we knew God would, would heed our every wish, that would not be faith. That would be something very different. So Jesus lingered where he was, and then finally arrived in Bethany and found Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. See, there were some Jews in the time who believed that the soul of the person stayed in the body three days after death. And then the soul of the dead person would depart. Four days meant that Lazarus was really clinically absolutely dead and there was no life left in him. That's why Martha was in such a state when she heard that Jesus was coming. She went out to meet him. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. As our story progresses, Mary says those same words too when she sees Jesus. In fact, you and I have probably said those same words or something very similar. Lord, if you had been here, Lord, if you had come when I asked, Lord, life hurts, and I asked for help, and I feel like you left me out there to suffer. Lord, it's too late, and the grief is here to stay. Maybe you've had those feelings and said those kinds of words. Maybe you felt abandoned by God. And when you feel that way, you grieve and feel that God is nowhere to be found. But in reality, that's when God waits for us. When Martha said, tells Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, it's hard to tell if she's confessing her faith in Jesus and his, <coughs> excuse me, and his power to heal, or if she's accusing him of neglecting his friend. Either way, Jesus comes back at her with words that are powerful in our lives. I am the resurrection and the life. And then he challenges her. Jesus asks Martha if she believes. It's interesting that John always puts this word into its active verb form. John doesn't talk about belief as a noun, but always as what Jesus asks us to do. Faith is not what we have, not something inside of us, something hidden and personal. It's what we do. It's how we act. It's what makes us move. At first, Martha thinks he is talking about some kind of future res resurrection, the kind the Pharisees believed in. But Jesus changes the definition of resurrection here. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe me? Jesus is challenging her to move beyond her anger at his absence, at Lazarus's death, and put her trust in him. And from Martha comes the words that are at the heart of the Christian faith. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Then Martha went to get Mary, um, who said the same thing to Jesus. If you had been here, Jesus. And Jesus was deeply moved by these two grieving sisters. His heart went out to them, and he wept with them. Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the whole Bible, and it's also one of the most powerful. To know that Jesus cares, that he enters into our pain and our suffering, is at the very heart of our faith. Then Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb. 
it was a cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. And Jesus said, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, always the practical one, by this time there is a bad odor. For he's been in it for four days. As the old King James version of the Bible so eloquently puts it, he stinketh. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? It was an I told you so moment by Jesus. So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I'm saying this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And after he said this, Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. I heard once that if Jesus hadn't limited the command to Lazarus, every corpse in the graveyard would have come forth. Did you ever imagine what happened next? What if there was a little camera in the graveyard? Well, there was a whoosh and a movement faster than the speed of light. And then instead of being wrapped in warmth and light and love, Lazarus found himself in darkness in a stone cold tomb. Imagine yourself waking up in that cave, wrapped tightly in a cloth, unable to pull the covering off your face because your hands are bound. If you have the image of a mummy in your mind, maybe you're normal. It's dark and it stinks in there, and you realize the smell is your own rotting flesh, which somehow isn't rotting anymore. But the stench is still hanging in the dampness of the cave. And you hear a familiar voice, muffled, but you recognize it. It's your best friend in the world calling you to come out. You don't even know which direction the door is or how to get out. You, you wiggle around enough to get up and you inch your way toward the light. As you trip over yourself, struggling to get free, there's a gasp from the crowd that has gathered outside the cave, and they are as surprised to see you as you are to be there. And then you must decide. Do you fall back into the tomb, or do you step out into the light and the unknown? Because what lies ahead is completely new territory. No one has ever done this before. But here you are. As you stumble forward, the voice you love says, unbind him, unbind her, and let them go. And the bandages come off, and you can see Jesus standing there, tears streaming down his face, welcoming you back to life. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus could have walked up and hugged Lazarus, but no, he remained socially distant. Not because of the germs, mind you, but Jesus had something else in mind. Just as Jesus had those in the crowd roll away the stone, now he told them to un unbind him and let him go. That's the way God works in the world. God uses us. God seeks human cooperation to accomplish God's purposes. God doesn't have to do that, but God chooses to. Jesus told his disciples and us to follow him, to love as he loved, to serve as he served, to lay down our lives for others just as he did. And that means we are invited to join God in the work of redemption, to be a part of the church and help roll away stones and remove grave clothes from people in the world who are entombed in fear or loneliness or failure or resentment or sickness or this pandemic. When John wrote his story and shared it with his community, the early church, they needed to hear this story. They were living at the end of the first century in a kind of exile themselves, separated from the temple, at odds with the religion of their parents, struggling to keep their identity intact and their faith alive, even in the face of Roman persecution. It was tough to live as a Christian in those days and scary. They saw Roman crosses fill the hilltops all around them as those in power tried to show their might. When things got tough, they sometimes forgot about God's power. 
And so they needed to hear the story that brought them together in the first place. They needed to remember the story of the resurrection, not just Jesus' resurrection at Easter, but the resurrection that brings all of us new life. The real ending to this 45 verse long story isn't in verse 45. It's in what happened after this. In reality, by raising Lazarus, Jesus signed his own arrest warrant. What should have been a celebration of Lazarus's new life, in reality, sealed Jesus' death. In the very next chapter in John's Gospel, one of the disciples prepares to sell him out. Mary anoints Jesus for his death, and the authorities plot to kill Jesus and Lazarus. But we know what happened after that. Easter happened. New life and resurrection happened. In every moment where it seems death is won, in every place where it seems that there is nothing but devastation, in every place where it seems all hope is gone, there, there is where you find Jesus standing in the midst of grief, shouting for all the world to hear, Lazarus, come out. How do I know that? Because every time I see devastation, a house that burns down, or a horrible accident, or something we never imagined to happen happening, that's when I see God at work in the world through us. Right now, when you turn on the TV, you see the latest numbers of people who test positive for the coronavirus. You, when you hear, and you hear doctors pleading for equipment, and you sit there thinking, how can this be in our country, in, in, this, in this age? It's just unbelievable. And yet that's when we know that God is not done with us yet. Preacher and writer Barbara Brown Taylor puts it beautifully, but she admits it's a message that can empty a church out fast. So I guess we are safe. The churches are pretty empty to begin with. And we need a word of hope. She writes, hello. It's lovely to see you this morning. My message today will be brief and to the point. God is not in the business of protecting us from harm, and no amount of behavior will keep us safe. She adds in quotation marks, for evidence of this, see the cross. Instead, she says, God is in the business of restoring us to life, which may involve some, some painful procedures. If we are willing to go through it and the operation is successful, our lives will not belong to us anymore. The message of the cross, you see, is about how to stop trying to make it in this world and how to fall in love with God instead. It's about God's power, not ours. That's a message we need to hear in our world today as much as they need it back in John's little church. We need to hear about God's power and love. And it happens to be thundering right now, so maybe that's just fine. But we need to hear about God's power and love because sometimes we hear different things out there in the world. We hear things like this virus is God's wrath and that the end of the world is near and, and that this pandemic is an act of God. If someone tells you that, tell them to read the Bible and stop listening to those TV preachers. Number one, nobody knows the day or hour. Number two, this is not an act of God. Just like tornadoes and hurricanes and any kind of natural disaster is not an act of God. I don't, I don't think God calls this pandemic any more than God causes somebody to have cancer or God causes a child to get hit by a car any more than God caused Lazarus to die so that Jesus could raise him again. What I do believe is that God can use these things that happen. God can work through our darkest day and through our worst disasters. God didn't cause a, a family's house to burn down on Christmas Day a couple of years ago in our community, but I think God had a hand in bringing hundreds of people from our community together a week later to clean up so they could begin the long process of rebuilding. God doesn't cause a tragic death. But God brings closer, brings together family and friends 
and an extended community to bring food and tell stories and offer aid. God stirs our faith, our love, and we want to be involved. We want to serve like Jesus did. I think God has something in mind through all of this. Or as Anne Lamott says, God has skills and ideas of how to use this time. Boy, does God ever. We just have to be willing to let God work through us, much like Martha and Mary and Lazarus did. And let God use us like the crowd who moved the stone and unwrapped the bandages. And let God use this time when we have to learn to live a little bit differently. It's not going to be easy, but God will go with us. May God use us all during this time for God's glory. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we give you thanks for Mary and Martha and Lazarus and all that they teach us about letting you work through our lives and how you go with us, even in these difficult days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, um, I asked my congregation to send me some prayer concerns or any announcements that they had, um, and I didn't hear from any of you, um, but there's a couple um, that I wanted to share anyway. Um, first of all, a joy, um, and that is our little Isaac at church, at Norrisville Church, had his third birthday yesterday. Um, Isaac was born with a heart problem and had surgery when he was two days old. And even after the surgery, he was smiling and he still brings a smile to us today. So happy birthday, Isaac. Um, I know that all of our York County folks are kind of uh, locked down now, so we're praying for you. Um, and, but truly all of us should be staying at home um, and being very careful, listening to the advice um, of the professionals as we um, as we try to um, get this pandemic under control um, in our community and beyond. Let's bow in prayer. God, at this moment and the next, this world is changing so rapidly, and our leaders are giving us new instructions daily. In our decision-making, remind us that taking a deep breath and inhaling the Spirit's presence and peace will help us to focus on you and your intentions. As our minds get dizzy from the overabundance of information and swim from the surrealism life now has to offer us, may your clarity direct our focus through the clouds and the clowns. May we listen to reason and push aside the eerie noises of self-interested voices. We're living in a time like no other. As our emotions begin to burst forth from us, Give us the comfort we need to see your peace and surround us with people who will help us find our grounding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, thanks for joining us today um, or in the days to come. Um, I'm tickled to death. We had 800 views, a few over that last week. Um, and that's just phenomenal. So, um, so I hope to see you in church sometime soon. Uh, when we can all be together again. Hear are these words that conclude our worship today, our benediction. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake, handshake of a stranger, or full shelves at the grocery store, conversations with our neighbor, a crowded theater or a Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush in the morning, coffee with a friend, a stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, and life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we've wanted to be. We're called to be, we hope to be, and may we stay that way better for each other because of the worst. My friends, stay safe and trust God, and be at peace. May God bless you all. Amen.